All right. Well, welcome everyone to our October Gardening in the Panhandle Live. I am Beth Bowles, a new face as moderator. I'm taking the place of our normal host, Daniel Leonard. Glad to be with you while Daniel's away for Gardening Myths and Home Remedies. We've got a great panel for you. Welcome to our friends on both Zoom and watching on Facebook Live. Uh, behind the scenes, we have a terrific team helping us out. We have Julie McConnell from Bay County, Josh Chris from Santa Rosa, and Matt Orwat, who's going to be over on Facebook from Washington County. But before we get started, we want to introduce our panelists. You may see some new faces there. And so I'm going to throw it to Donna, our newest agent here in the Panhandle. We are so excited to have you here. So Donna, say hello. Hello, everybody. Thanks for having me. And I look forward to the great and stimulating discussions. All right, Mark, give us an intro. Hey, everyone. I'm Mark Tanzig. I'm the Horticole Agent in Leon County. So to go Tallahassee and Woodville and all those little places. So I uh, can't wait to talk more about these garden myths. And unfortunately, I think we are going to burst people's bubbles a little bit today, but that's what we do. That's what we do. We burst bubbles. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Doom and gloom on the way. Larry, give us an intro, please. Good afternoon from the central time zone in Florida. I'm in Okaloosa County, and I'm looking forward to this topic. I think it's a fun topic, and um, I hope you learn something. All right. And our very distinguished guest, all the way from Gainesville, Dr. Adam Dale. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Adam Dale. I am an associate professor at the University of Florida in Gainesville. Um, and my area of expertise is uh, insects that live in lawns and on trees and shrubs. Any plant in a landscape, if there's a bug on it, that kind of falls under our umbrella. All right. Thanks, panelists. And Don is an entomologist, too, just for a little background there. I'm, I'm just to have Beth, I'm over here in Gadsden County. So... All right. She's the, <laughs> one of the few like me is still in me and Dr. Dale are, are yeah. Eastern time folks. Right. So, well, just so you're aware, you're going to have some information that shows up in the chat as we go through our session. So when a speaker's answering a question, if there's supplemental information, uh, Josh will put that in the Zoom chat and then Matt will follow that up on Facebook. Uh, don't worry if you don't get everything. This will have an article associated with this session at a later date. But first of all, we're going to kick off to you, Dr. Dale, just to kind of get us started here about home products. When we look on the internet or talk to our gardening friends, there's always kind of a concoction out there nowadays. Uh, so what should we be aware of or know about some of these home products that are being used for pest control? <clears throat> Yeah, so that's a great question. And as you said, it's something that we hear about a lot. Um, but when you think about pest control and products for pest control, that's what we call pesticides. Um, and so pesticides are products used to control insect pests, diseases, weeds. Um, so these materials are specifically manufactured and labeled and sold for controlling those pests. Um, most home products are not pesticides. They do not have a label that describes what pests they were manufactured to control for, um, and they're not intended for that use. So we don't recommend those products. Uh, so one product, for example, would be uh, Dr. Bronner's soap. Um, that's one of the one I see all the time being used as a pest control product. If you read that bottle or container, there's no mention of pest control, pesticide. It's, it's not a pest control product. And if you ask the EPA, they will tell you it is technically illegal to use that product as a pesticide. Um, and the reason that we, in addition to legality reasons, we also don't recommend products that aren't pesticides um, because there are risks associated with that. So risks to you, to, to other people, to your pets, and to plants that you might be applying those products to. So um, they could cause a variety of different forms of harm to those uh, things that they come in contact with. So. Those are the main reasons we do not recommend homemade products. 
So I think at one time we may have all mixed us up a soap solution and sprayed it on a plant from some dishwashing material or soap in our house. We really shouldn't do that, right? Right, yeah, so uh, I, I'm guilty of that myself. Um, however, uh, when you think about uh, dish soaps, um, those types of things, those are detergents. Um, so one reason that's a risk to plants is that those detergents are made to dissolve oils um, and so if you spray that on a plant, you're stripping that plant's leave of its oils that are protecting it. And then you may come back the next day with a brown, crispy plant. We have enough problems with plants. So be cautious with those soaps so we don't have brown, crispy plants. Well, Donna, uh, on that note, since we're not really going to be using some of these household things, are there products a homeowner can use that are more organic that they could choose for some home pest solutions in the lawn and landscape? Thanks for the question, Miss. Yes, there are several other organic pesticides that are that can be used in the home that is commercially available. While there are risks with some of them, you know, you can do further reading to see the problem. But I'm going to list a few of these, like you have your oils. We talk about your neem oils and we talk about your um, citrus oil. So these are all available for to, to, uh, to control insect pests, like the soft bodies pests, the aphids. And also we talk about insecticidal soap. So I'm happy Dr. Dale brought that up. So there's a difference between that. It is more formulated to work with the insect pests and you, know, you can read about it. There's a label, you can read about it. There's also some plant extracts while some of these are not available in Florida, they still, you will find them on the internet. People can access them online, but most of them, they are ne not necessarily available for purchase in Florida or based on certain registration, it's not available. Also, we talk about the diet, diet to, sorry, I tongue tied with that word, <laughs> diatomaceous earth. Yes, I get tongue tied. So this one is also available where it kind of, it, it's good for those insects that you can use to soft body like your snails, desiccation. So it helps with that. And there is also like your microbial insecticides, your spinosads, your BT, that um, bacillus third genesis. I might damage that word, but it's, it's frequently called BT. So those are available and they do work. Even though we remember each product you're working with you need to still read their do's and don'ts and your protect youth, your environment, protect your plants, your pets. So you have to be reading those about those stuff as well. There's also the nemat the entomopathogenic nematodes that are available. And the list goes on. There's a number of them. But whatever product you're choosing, ideally it should be able to control the pest. You want to talk about toxicity, it should be low. These might be fast acting and there also might be. Um, they have a fast breakdown. So sometimes we can have certain issues with these, like it might lead into phytotoxicity or now um, you might not be able to get the product available, as I said before, and also not to leave out the cost and availability. These can be expensive and maybe you have to have certain registration to purchase it. And this is why we draw, we, a lot of persons go towards the homemade product. Why go spend a lot of money? I'm going to make my own concoction and it's all over the internet, but please listen to your agents, listen to your specialists. It's the best thing to do. So despite the product you're using, there are other reading materials available. I cannot put everything in one hour. So please, there's, there are other things you can read about to know about this product, but they are available. And whatever it is, whether it's be your harsh chemicals, your synthetic, your natural, you have to conform to certain rules, read your label, protect your environment, and also never importantly, protect your individual self. So you have to think about all of those things. Great points, Donna, and really good list. And remember, even though some of these products might be a little pricier, if you accidentally kill your plant with something not labeled for it, you're gonna be paying a price anyway. Right. So look at it from that aspect. Um, but yeah, I love Donna's point about making sure that if a product is not labeled for Florida, we really cannot use it in Florida. So just be cautious if you need help with labels, that's why we're here. Um, so Dr. Dale, back to you. Donna mentioned these organic products. What about plants? Is there anything in the plant world we do to naturally manage pests? 
So that's a great question also. And Donna mentioned several products that are derived from plants. Um, so a lot of those uh, more organic and natural products come from plant extracts and other things that plants produce that they naturally defend themselves against insects uh, with. Um, but other than those, uh, in terms of plants, to me, the most effective uh, plant defense against uh, pests is selecting plants that are less susceptible to pests. Um, so uh, for example, uh, if you have hollies in your landscape, um, plant a uh, yopon holly or a dahoon holly instead of a Chinese holly um, or an American holly. And if you do that, you're gonna have significantly fewer pest problems from things like scale insects that attack those hollies. Um, there's other good staple plants like Florida anise um, or uh, sweet viburnum that, that, that get relatively few insect pests. And so you can have those plants in your landscape doing their function and you really don't have to do anything to manage them other than keeping the plant alive and healthy. Uh, so to me, picking the right plant to minimize pest problems is the best approach from a plant perspective. Yeah, and I think we have a great publication on kind of key plant, key pests. So you can get that too as well. Look that up on our Ask IFAS and, and look at some of those. And then as the courses you attend from our agents, we'll definitely share that information. Well, on that note, Mark, I have something that I see at the nursery all the time. So you see citronella plants for mosquito control or, or lemongrass to keep mosquitoes out. A homeowner asked, or a Zoom listener asked, is that going to help keep mosquitoes out of my yard? Again, we're bursting bubbles, Beth. So <laughs> no, I am sorry, everyone. It doesn't work like that. So I, I sometimes tease and say, you know, maybe if you were in a field of citronella plants and you rolled around in it, that might be pretty good at keeping mosquitoes away, but having that one little plant of lemongrass or citronella or whatever it might be, you know, it's not, there, there, there's been no research that shows that that's actually effective. Uh, and so what, uh, one of the links we're gonna put in the chat here is uh, the University of Florida's IFAS uh, Mosquito Control Guide. And they have some really good information towards the back of that document on what's effective mosquito control and what they've found, you know, based on research and experimentation, that just does not work. And so these plants come up as one of the things that, you know, just do not work. Now, citronella does, you know, extract can help. I think there's some information that shows you how long that actually lasts and is effective. And it's not as long as some of these other products. But, um, you know, for mosquito control in the lawn and the landscape around the house, really you're gonna be the best thing to do instead of purchasing these plants, right? Look for standing water, uh, drain them, you know, about every five days, go around and make sure everything's empty. And Donna mentioned Bacillus thuringiensis or thuringiensis, however we say that, BT. There's a very similar product called BTI. Uh, and those are those little mosquito dunks. You can find them as a little like donut looking thing or little crumbles. Uh, you put those in like say rain barrels, bird uh, baths, and that will prevent the mosquito larvae from turning to adults. So those are really, you know, between BTI and emptying your, uh, any standing water and think about your gutters, right? Gutters hold water for a while and they're very organic rich. Mosquitoes would love to breed in those little bits of water in your gutters. Uh, so just that's gonna be way more effective than putting up some citronella plants. So I'm sorry, but yeah, just skip on by the citronella plants. Now they're a pretty plant and they smell good, but don't think the mosquitoes are gonna stay away. So Mark's recommendation, y'all, is to plant a field of lemongrass or citronella and you'll be great. And roll in it. And roll in it. All right. I love that recommendation. <laughs> Good stuff here from UF IFAS. Larry, don't <laughs> worry. We're going to get to you in just a minute. But we have one more question first on this kind of topic from Dr. Dale for Dr. Dale about companion plants. A uh, listener asked, do they work? Is that helping pest management? So that's a good question um, and something else that came to mind uh, when I saw the, the question about plants for pest control. So companion plants, um, another way to describe companion plants are putting out 
different plant species near your garden or in your landscape that attract beneficial organisms that then help either uh, reduce the number of pests that come into your garden or they help control those pests once they are in there. Uh, and this can be a really effective uh, addition to your landscape. So I typically tell people that that is, is not a single solution, but it's something that makes a big difference. So uh, we've done some research uh, looking at the effects of having uh, flowering plants in, in a landscape next to a lawn uh, compared to lawn areas that don't have flowering plants next to them. And the lawns that have flowering plants next to them have about 50% more predation and parasitism of caterpillar pests like fall army worms or tropical side web worms. Um, so those lawns that have these flowering plants nearby have fewer pests because things like wasps and uh, beetles and predatory flies, those things all go get attracted to flowers where they feed on flower pollen and nectar, but they also feed their babies other insects. And so they're when they're not on flowers, they're flying around snatching up caterpillars, taking them back to their nest and feeding them to their offspring. And that makes a big difference in terms of the pests you have in your garden. Yeah, you heard it here, wasp are beneficial, very much so. <laughs> yeah, you want wasps. And when I say wasps, uh, paper wasps and things like that do fall under that term, but uh, most wasps that are out there in your landscape are solitary, they keep to themselves, um, and you would oftentimes never know they're there uh, because they're just on a mission to go feed their offspring and reproduce. Uh, so things like yellow jackets and hornets and paper wasps, uh, although they do eat caterpillars and other pests, they're not something I tend to promote being around because they'll also sting you. So no yellow jackets for pest control. Yeah, those, those can be dangerous for people for sure. All right, Larry, you're up. So our next one uh, is about home remedies or something around the house. We have, we know we have a lot of caterpillar pests, but one of the ones we all see is that fall webworm that gets in persimmons and pecans and this giant web is in the tree. Is there anything a homeowner has uh, that they can use for that that's successful? Well, I think one, one thing people need to keep in mind, um, you, when you plant a plant, you plant everything that goes with that plant. And I like what uh, Dr. Dell mentioned earlier about plants that have few pest problems. It's possible to establish a landscape that is full of plants that just attract plants, I mean, pests. And that, that's one way to think about it. So when you think about th this particular insect, the fall webworm, which is commonly found in, you know, pecan, hickory, uh, common persimmon, sweet gum, black walnut, which we don't have a whole lot of black walnut trees in this, this part of the country, but bald cypress, I, I don't see them on the bald cypress that often. I see them more on uh, pecans and the persimmons, but they're very visible. They form this webbing. We get into the fall and have these bright, crisp blue skies and it, they, the sun's hitting this webbing and it just stands out and people worry with it. But I, I kind of think of it sometimes, you know, I know plants um, don't feel, at least we don't know that they do, but they, they don't feel or perceive that they have a problem, in, in my opinion, because this insect is feeding on something that is temporary that the plant's going to drop anyway. Um, even the bald cypress is deciduous. So sometimes we worry about it more than, quote, the plant worries about it. <laughs> and, and because of the worry, we start doing things that could potentially be real problems for the plant versus letting this caterpillar or these caterpillars run their course. Some examples of things that people ask about and unfortunately do before they ask about, they'll come in and prune out a limb or a branch, a larger limb. I, you know, that this, these insects have no capability of removing woody branches, limbs from the tree. 
they're only feeding on uh, the leaves. And if you were to tag your pecan tree or hickory or persimmon, whatever they're in, when they're in there and come back the next spring, I will promise you that you'll see early on as that tree leaves out a blemish free tree won't have these insects and where they were you'll have brand new leaves that uh, are on the tree and then sometimes we want to spray with insecticides but many times we're talking about large maturing trees and I kind of cringe when I think about someone on the ground with a hose in sprayer or handheld garden pump sprayer and they're spraying overhead and they're getting drenched in this stuff um, that's not a good option either um, you're doing more damage to, to yourself. The webbing itself can be water repellent. It, it uh, is something that the caterpillars produce to, to protect themselves from predators and, and uh, they're protected somewhat from rain and wind as they're eating those leaves uh, within that, that webbing. So when everything's said and done on this one, the best option I think is to kind of grin and bear it. Don't let it worry you. And you know, it, coming up to Halloween, uh, you've got some natural webbing out there. You know, we, we sometimes decorate for Halloween and you might think about it in a positive way. But these insects, this particular one, the fall web worm that gets into some of these trees looks like it's doing quite a bit of damage. But uh, in, in most cases, it's not. Now, commercially, if you live close to somebody that's growing pecans commercially, yes, they, they may take the option to treat, but they're trying to produce a crop that they're, they're hope, hopefully getting paid for, and there's an economic value there. I have rarely seen an infestation of these insects in a landscape tree that would uh, be to the extent or point where they're, they're truly doing enough damage to bother with, with treatment. Was Has anyone ever been asked about the torches, right? Like, oh, should I go burn those? That's a good point. Yeah, tree? right. It's a great point. That's another burn. one that we hear that, you know, you, there's no no little elf or whatever out in the woods. You can find these on trees along the fence rows in areas where no one's uh, doing anything out in the woods, out at natural areas, hickories, for example. And uh, most of these trees are native that we're talking about. And there's nobody out there treating these. They don't have torches. They're, you know, trying to control uh, an insect. And you've got to be careful with that, too, because we've been going through a dry period and you don't want to take a chance on um, a fire getting out of hand. But that can potentially do more damage to the tree in, in an effort to control an insect that's not really doing a whole lot of damage. Yeah, Larry, I love it. You've told us not to worry, and you've given us ideas for Halloween decorations. Perfect. <laughs> Two things at once. It's great. Well, Mark, we're coming back to you on a little different topic. We're moving into weeds, everyone's favorite subject of how to, how to care for. What about corn gluten meal? Uh, Zoom listener asked if that's going to work. They've heard about that maybe but it's a big maybe right so corn gluten there is some research that shows that it can be effective it's mostly as a pre-emergent so remember that's before you even see the weeds right so don't go pouring corn gluten on weeds that are already problematic that's not actually going to do anything so pre-emergent properties so before the weeds germinate corn gluten can provide a little bit of a one of these like weed blocker type herbicides but the other problem with corn gluten is it's only effective on a small number of species right so um, if you have a bad weed problem don't expect corn gluten unfortunately to take care of it all in a natural way right so there's lots of other options of herbicides that are you know like Dr. Dale was saying specifically formulated to go after the the problem that are going to be much more effective. Um, you're not going to have to, you know, be cursing the corn gluten person that gave you the, you know, the, the advice um, and spending corn gluten and throwing it out on your lawn and people thinking you're strange because you're putting out grits or corn gluten out on your yard. So just, you know, contact your agents. We'll give you a good prescription of herbicides, pre-emergent or post-emergent that you can use safely according to the label, like Donna said, and they'll be much more effective than, than corn gluten. And there's a good link there uh, of a, a professor over in Washington State that looked a little closely at this and even 
talked to the guy that patented corn gluten and even that person is a little you know here it is but uh, it doesn't work on everything it's expensive too right mark yeah it can be yeah yeah all right so maybe before you before you buy all right let's see dr dale what about beneficial nematodes uh, are these good to manage some landscape pests that people are buying? Do they really work? So beneficial nematodes are really cool. Um, so first, what are beneficial nematodes? Uh, these things are little tiny microscopic, microscopic worms that live in the soil, and they swim around in the soil looking for uh, insects to swim inside of. So uh, when they find a subterranean insect, so some sort of insect living in the soil, they will swim into that insect and any opening they can find. And then once they get inside of that insect, they uh, release a bacteria and then they reproduce and all the babies feed on that bacteria um, until the bacteria kills the insect. And then that dead insect erupts into a, a pile of a tiny pile of worms, and then they swim out through the soil um, looking for more insects to kill. Um, so uh, these are called insect parasitic nematodes, and they can be a really nice uh, addition to an IPM program or an integrated pest management program. And they can be effective, uh, but they're sensitive. So uh, for example, they're not going to do well in a really dry, hot, environment. So they need to have moist conditions because these things are swimming through the soil. Um, and you're not going to apply these onto the surface of leaves up above ground because they're not going to last very long in that environment. Uh, so these things are primarily used to control insects that spend at least part of their life cycle in the soil or on the soil uh, because that's where they're going to be most vulnerable to them. Um, but they can be effective for targeting some things. So some things uh, like white grub uh, beetles that feed on uh, your, the roots of your lawn, um, uh, bill bugs that feed on your lawn, uh, some caterpillars like fall armyworms or sod webworms that spend part of their life cycle as a pupa on the soil or in the soil. Um, so these types of things that, that can be pests um, can be reduced by having these nematodes around. And, most, and in most situations, they are there already, uh, but you can supplement those by buying a little bottle of them from a commercial uh, nematode producer. I'm glad we have some other options as well. So lots of tools in the toolbox for that. Terrific. Uh, well, on, in, on a soil topic, Donna, uh, we, we know it's really easy to raise the pH, but a homeowner wanted to know if it's really easy to lower the pH using sulfur. Does that really work? Oh, unmute, unmute Donna. I'm sorry, it does work, but I'll have to stress, but it is a temporary fix because in terms of adding your elemental sulfur to the soil, when those bacteria break it down and form that sulfuric acid, it is going to be localized to that one area that you apply the, the elemental sulfur. So it is only going to be a temporary fix. So the more permanent fix would have been to plant, like Dr. Dale said, right plant, right place. So if you can get those plant can tolerate a higher, like that type of pH condition, it would be better. Because over time, you're going to end up harming the plant because you have to do repeated application of this, the elemental sulfur. And if you try to increase those rates per 100 square feet, and if you keep increasing, then you are going to eventually you have to check for plant damages. So in the long run, I would just stick to plant, right plant, right place. It does happen, but it's really, it's really a, a sticky situation. And it is so difficult to really correct and a soil that is high in alkalinity it's really difficult so that's my little take on it well that's a message we preach all the time is right plant right place you hear yes. that probably on every single panel discussion we have 
Um, our next one, Larry, deals with uh, some people's greatest fear, which is our snakes. Uh, what about a repellent? Can they put out a repellent to keep these snakes away? And if so, are mothballs a good repellent? Thank you, Beth. Um, yeah, I think if you're an extension agent for any length of time and you work with the public or with farmers, you, you will deal with this question. And it seems to be a very common natural fear, but we, we do live in an area here in Florida where we, we have, I think it's 46 species of, of native snakes. And out of those, there's a handful that are considered to be venomous. So the first thing I would recommend is for a person um, not only to take time to learn those five or six potentially venomous snakes that we have out of the, the 46, but <clears throat> at an early age, teach your children, whether it's grandchildren or maybe neighbors that live close by, um, how to identify some of those that are potentially harmful, the venomous snakes. Any snake can bite. But um, it's rare to, to, talk, to find a person that's actually been bitten by a snake. And when you, when you talk to people, even larger groups, and ask that question, out of 100 people, and I've done this before, there might be two or three that raise their hands. And it, 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 when you ask the question, have you ever actually been bitten by a snake? And sometimes they'll raise their hand because they know someone else that was bitten by a snake. And then the next question is, well, what happened to that person? Well, they're fine. And I would always take it seriously if you are bitten by a snake, but what, this is something that people react to based on fear. And we do live in a habitat and environment where snakes exist. And so they're looking for uh, anything that might offer some help. And these products, uh, one of which I think carries the name snake away, it contains um, one of the active ingredients in mothballs and sulfur kind of mixed together. When you open the container, you can absolutely smell the moth, you know, typical mothball smell. It's almost overwhelming. But work that's been done with those products, you know, you think about the rain that we get, and we've been dry a little bit, but here in the panhandle, we've gotten some rain just, you know, recently, yesterday and early this morning. And Mothballs either have paradichlorobenzene or naphthalene as the active ingredient. Typically, naph naphthalene that has that classic mothball smell is extremely water soluble. Sulfur is as well. And the question about use of sulfur, you know, it's very temporary. It, it washes away if you have an irrigation system that comes on or if you get almost any amount of rain, it, it dilutes it and it washes away, it moves with the water. So it, it's very temporary at best. And the work that I'm aware of that's been done with these types of products show that they're really not that effective in um, keeping snakes away. Maybe there's some value in that, well, I've done something that might help, but when you really look into it, it, it doesn't really help. Um, the best thing to do with snakes, number one, Learn to identify those that are venomous. Try to have a landscape that is not something that's going to be attracting snakes. You know, you think about brush piles and if you have a fireplace, fire pits, indoor fireplace where you store wood outside, those are places that snakes would, would like to, uh, to get to overwinter. Um, maybe during the day when it's hot in the summer months, the hiding place. If you have water features in your landscape, you're almost guaranteed to attract um, frogs and there's certain aquatic or snakes that are that live in that environment, aquatic environment that will come in because of that. I tell people sometimes to think about it like this. When you see a bird come into your landscape, are you that worried? And they'll come and go. But if a bird flies into your landscape and it finds what it needs, it finds food, shelter and um, and water then it might say, hey, this is a great place to live and raise some young. And so think about it from that standpoint, what areas do I have in my landscape that would be uh, attractive to snakes? And um, even, even things like not leaving dog food out overnight 
outdoors that's going to attract rodents. If you look at these snakes that we have, most of them love rodents, whether it's mice or rats, and even bird feed, when, when it falls on the ground at night, if you go out with a flashlight, if it's left there, um, that can attract certain rodents that are out roaming around at night. And then the snake happens to come in and finds a great food source that you're attracting. Well, it all adds up to issues. The final thing I would say is to inspect your home for entry points. And sometimes we don't think about that, but snakes can enter through small places and some common areas to look at are, are those areas where plumbing comes into the home, where there's openings uh, with the pipes, um, securing that. And there's a number of ways of doing that. Um, the publication that I think is in the link shows you some ideas there using um, things to uh, the screens and those kinds of things for climbing snakes that can get into vents. Um, some ways you may want to think like a snake as you're looking around and what, you know, if you keep the garage door open all the time and the dog's food bowls in there, that's easy entry and they may venture in into your garage and um, the openings underneath doors, you know, that those, those little strips that are supposed to keep water and, and, and wind and that's the, you know, the, the, um, I don't know what to call them. It's uh, the, the little usually rubber strips that uh, can yeah, come off stops and door sweeps you know, and things. Yeah. Inspect those, replace them as, as needed. So that's, that's what I would advise. That's a lot of good advice, Larry. I think we're, we're you know, that good landscape modification is important. All right. Yeah. Think about Thank Laura's you. pest control, right? For your, uh, your rodents. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, Mark, we've got a question about biosolids. So Ooh, is it exciting. safe to use some of the class A or class AA biosolids that maybe a local municipality is producing on a vegetable garden? Okay, yeah. So this one came in and it came in with a specific question about ECUA, which I had to go look up, but that is actually from Escambia County. And now that I learned some more about this, I want it here in Leon County because this sounds like amazing stuff, Beth. It is. Um, so... The question is, can we use it in now? The specific question is, can we use this stuff in our vegetable garden? So I honestly, I meant to get with my, my ag agent. So Donna, uh, Lawler, someone step up to help me out here. If you need, to, I might need some help here in a minute. But so biosolids, first of all, are um, it's a byproduct of the wastewater treatment system, right? So all of our, we go to the bathroom, we flush the toilet, it magically disappears. It goes to the treatment plant. They take it through all sorts of, you know, methods of treatment. They're left at the end with a bit of a sludge, right? It's kind of gross. They dry it off and they're left with um, a solid-like material. Most of the time, we're going to tell you that no, do not use anything like bi no biosolids for crops for human consumption, right? So a lot of um, wastewater treatment plants, that material will be sent off and maybe you put it on a corn field that you're going to use corn for forage for cows or cattle or other feed, right? Now, this particular biosolid product, though, I looked it up, and there's some uh, links here on the in the chat. And we'll sh again, we'll share these in an article, and you'll, you'll get some information later. These, so biosolids that are treated to a certain level can be used on vegetable crops, on crops used for human consumption. The Escambia County Utilities Authority, I think that's what the UA is for, they've basically, they treat this these biosolids to this high level. I think they're even class AA. So there's class A and there's class AA. So they go above and beyond. They then taking those biosolids and they're making a compost, basically. They're mixing it with yard debris from the, you know, what people put out on the side of the road. Uh, so this, yes, can be used in vegetable gardens. Now, I would still say, because it is, from you know human waste uh, and anytime you're using manures whether it be from humans um, cattle chickens whatever there's some good general food safety practices you want to put in place so donna matt lawler in the background there help me out what's the rule but if you're going to harvest like say leafy greens is it 30 days you want to you know you wouldn't apply 30 days from harvest manures is that the right 
there's some 30, 60, 90 something. I can never remember exactly how it goes. I'm, I'm, I'm not too keen on that product in terms of the residual period, but I'll, I'm not too keen okay, on Okay, there, I know there's a kind of a general uh, 120 days. So there's Matt Lawler. Yeah. So okay. for leafy greens that are not going to be cooked, you would, you know, manures shouldn't go out 120 days before harvest. I mean, I would just make sure you're, you know, these are safe. They've been treated to a high level to get rid of the pathogens, which is what we're really worried about. Um, so I would just, if you're going to be eating these things raw out of the garden, you know, where they're not going to get cooked, always wash your vegetables. I've learned from all my, my fancy folks, you got to wash your vegetables. The FC, Family Consumer Science Agents, you got to wash your veggies before you eat them. If you're not going to be cooking them, um, you may want to give it a little extra time. But that's just me wanting to be really safe and make sure no one gets ill. These are treated to a very high level and so are legally allowed to be used on vegetable crops. Yeah, we've used the bloom at our garden here. So we're just careful to clean things. You know, you have the idea you're going to go pick something out of the garden and eat it. You know, a lot of us have done that, but we just are a little more cautious with certain yeah. things to be clean and healthy. But I would love to have something like that. I'm going to go tell our solid waste people about all this because that'd be amazing. That's a good resource for the community. I love it. Thanks, Mark. And, and thanks, Matt Lawler, for putting that information in the chat about the days to harvest. Uh, Adam, we're back to you and talking about oil sprays. So we know horticultural oils, the petroleum based. What about vegetable oils? Can a homeowner use a vegetable oil in place if they don't want to use a petroleum product? So that's a good question. Very similar to, to uh, thinking about using dish detergent soaps versus insecticidal soaps. Uh, so my recommendation is always no, do not use any home, home product oils like vegetable oils uh, and apply those to your plants. Um, it's basically imagine covering yourself in vegetable oil and going out by the pool on a very sunny day or going out to the beach and just laying out there in the sun, fully soaking up the sun rays and what that would do to your skin. Uh, that's what's happening when you apply these things to a plant uh, and that plant gets exposed to any kind of sunlight. Uh, so you're, you're introducing a lot of opportunity for damage to any plant that you apply that material to. Uh, because the plant is very, the, the cuticle of leaves and the plant tissue is very sensitive to sunlight um, and any changes in the regulation of water being moved in and out of that leaf. Um, so applying oils that aren't intended for plants onto plants is generally a bad move. <laughs> um, and again, it's also not intended to be used as a pesticide. There's no pesticide label on that product, so you shouldn't use it as such. Well, if anyone has checked out my thesis from the University of Tennessee Library, and I know y'all are running out to do that, Ooh, I'm gonna go I look did it up now. use a soybean oil to control San Jose scale and mites, but like Dr. Dale said, it was labeled for that purpose. It wasn't out of the, the cabinet or pantry. So make sure things are labeled for their intended purpose. That's our, our kind of take home message here. Yeah, uh, that's a good point, Beth. There are some plant-based oils that are intended for pest control, um, but not typically the ones you have in your kitchen cabinet. Right, right. So y'all be sure to read that thesis tonight. Uh, so Mark, on that note, still we're of, of homemade products. What about weed control? We see everything online about mixing vinegars and dishwashing, or even just using vinegar. Uh, what about that to, to manage weeds? Uh, going back to what Dr. Dale has been saying, and even what Donna mentioned about safety, right? So this these products are not intended to kill weeds in this case. That's our pest we're talking about. Um, so there's things that could go wrong. And when we're talking about, say, mixing salt and vinegar or some sort of salt concoction, let's remember that the Romans destroyed their enemies by salting the earth and their crops did not grow. I have had people calling me saying that we had a bunch of doveweed. Everyone hates doveweed. You know, it's fine. 
they put salt out on it. It killed the dubweed, but no grass grew there. I think the guy said three years, nothing has grown in this spot, this spot where he put salt, right? So it can be effective, but it's, you know, you're, you're going to probably get more damage um, than any kind of uh, benefit out of it. When we talk about some of these products too, the safety, so the horticulture or the, the vinegar, homemade vinegar or like uh, household vinegar is a pretty low concentration. Uh, when you, you may get some effectiveness, uh, but most, uh, there is some vinegar products that are labeled for weed control. So if you're an organic farmer, uh, you might want to use, uh, say, a horticultural grade industrial strength vinegar uh, that's labeled for herbicides or for pest control. Um, that's but 20%, thing, right? So the horticultural, I think, is even more. Um, I think I've seen like 40. I have to look at the label again or go check it out, but it's pretty high. And what we get is like a 10 or something like that. It's very low, maybe even less. The thing is with vinegar, it will burn you. It can burn your skin. It can burn your eyes. It's very dangerous, right? So some of the products on the shelf that are intended for killing weeds, they're developed so that they work effectively on the crops. It says they're on the weeds. It says it's going to kill. And they're also checked to make sure that they're safe for you, right? So um, I would say, don't worry about any homemade weed control. There's always going to be weeds. I'm sorry, but there's, you're never getting rid of weeds. So just, you know, the best homemade thing to do is to get down on your knees and just pull by hand. That's, that's about the best you can do. Um, if you want to kill weeds, use products that are intended, that have a label. They've been tested for your safety and plant safety. And weed pulling is pretty therapeutic at times. It's not very all therapeutic. the time. Not all the time, but a lot right, of Right. And getting those microbes on your fingers, kind of get the serotonin going. It's it's really good for you. So pull more weeds. Well, you mentioned salt. So Larry, I'm gonna skip down to you quickly because one of the questions here asks about Epsom salts and and using that for plant growth. What is that? And does it should we just put that out for plants? That's a good question. Common uh, for homeowners to do that. And I think sometimes where this starts, a neighbor uses it and by chance, maybe pure chance, they <clears throat> read or they somebody told them about the use of Epsom salt, which is magnesium sulfate, both of which are essential elements for plants. But um, they used it, for example, maybe on their tomatoes. And that year, they had the best tomatoes they had ever produced. So now they're the local neighborhood guru that's telling everybody, hey, all you have to do is put Epsom salt out, and you'll have the best tomatoes you've ever wanted. And they just lucked up on this. When we're talking about plant elements that are essential, you can have a deficiency, which would be underdoing it or you can certainly overdo it. And it's best not to guess soil test. And the soil test from the University of Florida, which you can check with your local extension office and they can get you set up on not only how to correctly take a soil sample, but how to submit it, how to get it to the lab. It's a $10 test. If you looked at the cost of a bag of fertilizer lately, that's you know a lot more than $10. And what you get back is in parts per million, the level of phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, calcium, sulfur, copper, manganese, and zinc. It's a good, um, you know, a lot of different essential elements that will tell you specifically what is low and based on what is low, how much to add. And that's my approach. Uh, don't use magnesium sulfate, which is what is in the Epsom salt haphazardly just because someone else did. You can test and see where you are on magnesium. And if it's low, that may be one option, but there are you know, other fertilizers that can be used to increase the amount of magnesium to the proper level that's needed for plant growth. Oh, good point. Soil test, always. Well, Donna, on that same note for soil improvement, do eggshells really add calcium to the soil? I'm going to put it out there and say, yes, it does. But it comes with conditions because of that, the calcium carbonate in that eggshell is so hard. So in order to, for the plant to absorb it, it's a good way to grind it up or 
refine it or get it into finer dust. That way the plant can absorb it. But even further, another way to benefit from it also, you can also maybe crush those eggshells and just incorporate it in your compost. Because sometimes if you pull those plants, you will still see evidence of the big shells if you don't break them down properly. So it does benefit your plant, but the good thing is to grind it, refine it, so it turns into dust and it should help. But in a yeah, long term, yeah, so, so. I actually have a master gardener who bought a, a blender at the flea market just for his eggshells. <laughs> So it, well, I can, I can tell you that compost, yeah. I just harvested some worm castings from the backyard and I take the eggshells and I usually crush them up before I put them in there. And this right. is a, probably a pile that's maybe two years old, at least. Mm -hmm. The eggshells are still in there. You know, I still see them, but it's so it's a slow, I think it's just a slow process, right, Donna? It is. It is. It might take, you know, it's a slow process. So it's good to grind it up so you can get the immediate benefit from it. And I'm, like I said, Grind it somehow and put it in your compost, you know. So it does take a while, but it does help. All right. Do you, we had a question from Facebook? Does anyone want to help? Do coffee grounds really acidify the soil very much? Mm. Anyone well, I do a lot one? of comp I do a lot of talks on compost. Well, you know, most of the acid actually um, ends up in our coffee, right? So our the coffee grinds are not super acidic, so they're not gonna they're not gonna help with sulfur like Donna was talking about earlier. Um, they're kind of as far as are they helpful for the garden? Sure, there is. There are basically you would consider them like a green product, a nitrogen containing product. So they are going to be kind of like a slow release fertilizer. You can throw them into your compost. It's really great for adding to compost or a worm bin. Um, I've heard of people using them as a little like a surface mulch almost mm -hmm. uh, to kind of put it on the surface that's but, also just fine you know it's not going to hurt anything and it might add a little bit of nutrients over time and it will probably stimulate your microbes right because we all get excited when we drink coffee i think the microbes get a little bit of a boost as well um i just picked some up actually from starbucks you know starbucks puts them out on the mm -hmm. uh in the bin and i just pick myself up some if i may add quickly the key thing is moderation you know, if you're putting out yeah, yeah. it has to do with moderation as well, like anything in life, moderation. So, so these are more amendments. They're yeah. not just to be dumped somewhere. They're, you're amending them, adding them, and mixing them into the soil. All right. Well, guess what, everyone? We're getting close to the end, and we are going to finish up on the hottest topic of all <laughs> uh, with Dr. Dale and Donna. Uh, fire ants. There are so many managements swirling around fire ants. Uh, and even I went to the nursery to buy some insecticide and someone pulled me aside. Hey, you don't need to buy that. Try this homemade product <laughs> instead. So Dr. Dale, give us the, the real story about a few of these things like grits and club soda. Do they work? Uh, so in short, no, they do not work. Um, the most effective, so fire ants, starting taking a step back, fire ants are an invasive species that has kind of moved up through a, maybe the, the southern half of the United States. Um, and these things are extremely competitive and extremely aggressive. So they move into spaces and kind of dominate that space. Uh, out competing other ants and other native insects. Um, and if you've ever seen a fire ant mound, you, you know they can kind of get pretty large. And then if you kick it or touch stick it at all, it. Yeah. stick your hand in it. Do not <laughs> stick your hand in it. Don't do that. Uh, it erupts in ants. And those things are trying to sting you. They they sting. They do not bite. They sting. They, they bite you and then they hold on to you with those mouth parts and then just stab you with their stinger um they are are dangerous um so some people have really bad reactions to those things and get really swollen up or go um even can go into anaphylactic shock um so they're so they are not something to to mess with um and the most effective way to control these things if once you have mounds is using insecticides that are specifically formulated to control fire ants. And the most effective of those are uh, baits that you um, either broadcast 
uh, around your yard, kind of like a fertilizer out of a spreader, um, or you can sprinkle the bait around the mounds. Um, the key being sprinkling it around the mounds, not on top of the mound. If you, if you put it on top of the mound, it's the same thing as disturbing that mound. And rather than taking that bait and bringing it back down to the queen, they will just try to defend the mound and then they'll move to another spot in the yard. Um, so using baits, insecticide baits like Amdro, uh, sprinkling that around the mound is the most effective thing. If you have a bunch of mounds all in your yard, then uh, broadcasting that throughout the yard is probably the best bet. Um, but some of these homemade uh, or uh, kind of homegrown solutions tend to only encourage the ants to move to another spot and they don't go away. So if you think about an ant colony, there's thousands and thousands of these ants and they all kind of report back to one queen or a few queens. But if those queens are still alive, those are the reproduction machines of the colony. And if that queen doesn't die, uh, then she's gonna keep reproducing and there's still gonna be ants. Uh, so doing things like pouring boiling water on an ant mound is more of a, a risk to yourself than it is to the, to the queen. The queen's probably not going to get exposed to that boiling hot water, but you might dump it on yourself. <laughs> and kill a few <laughs> plants in the process or your turf, right? Yeah, and, and have a, a dead spot in your yard where all the plants got boiled. Yeah, I can see myself carrying a bucket of boiling water across the yard at five feet tall. <laughs> That's not a don't, good thing. Don't do that. Donna, what about this idea of uh, taking a mound and tossing it on a another mound? Do ants have Tuesday night fights? <laughs> Explicitly, no, it doesn't work. People have tried it, but it doesn't work because the queens are not, they are not that territorial. But they have a multi-queen colony, as Dr. Dale said, or a single queen colony. They are not going to compete. They're not going to be territorial like that. So, you know, and you know that the queen is the one that drives the entire uh, moon. So they're not going to be territorial and most likely you mix them, you're helping them. So I wouldn't, mm -hmm. I wouldn't, it's not, it's a myth. I wouldn't work with that system. And then also, again, they're running up the shovel that you're digging them out. So right, yeah, that's, a, that's all I see. Yeah, but what people people took it further to recommend that you use talcum powder or baby powder so the ants don't get on the shovel. And so there's a whole lot of things <laughs> going around out there, but it's just not it's not feasible to control that invasive species. No. Yeah, I don't know why fire ant seems to have the most myths around it. I think we just want them gone so badly yeah. because they are that invasive species. Uh, so on that note, uh, we're really, you know, it's been a great discussion today. Thank you, panelists. Uh, we're probably going to go ahead and, and end it there. Any final thoughts uh, about what's going on from any of the panelists? Any, anything you want to add to end up? I would say just if you ever have questions, you know who to call, right? In every county, we have an extension office where you can call and you can get some research-backed solutions to your problems. So give us a call and we will help you out. And also I will add, Julie just put the survey in the chat. So everyone on Zoom and Facebook, uh, click on that link and uh, let us know how we did. Yeah, and funny enough that you me. mentioned link, Mark, don't forget we are that link that provides, if we can't help you, we'll link you to somebody. So Look at Donna. That's our new slogan, <laughs> Look, she's, Donna. she's new, but she figured it all out already. <laughs> yes, Donna. I did. Don has just come up with the UFI for this new slogan. We'll link you. <laughs> yeah. All right. I, I really want to thank our panelists for being here and Dr. Dale for taking your time from Gainesville. We have University of Florida has excellent specialists. And again, thanks to the behind the scenes crew, uh, Julie, Matt, Josh, and, and Matt Lawler. Uh, we really appreciate it. All your help. Uh, if you remember, there's no more gardening the panhandle this year, but if you have a topic you would like us to talk about on a future one, we're developing those now, please join us uh, for future events and tell us what you would like to hear about. Fill out that survey. That certainly helps us out and follow us on Facebook at Gardening in the Panhandle. And we hope to see you in the future. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.